evening, everybody. Welcome to Coffee and Tequila. My name is Zachary Patton Garcia, your host here for the Tuesday Night Late Show, I guess, is what we're going to do today. <laughs> um, as you're listening to this, you should be noticing two things, right? First off, I, this episode of Coffee and Tequila, as always, is kind of being sponsored by Helix Sleep, and we will let you know a little bit more about them a little bit later. But yeah, you should be noticing two things about this episode. The first thing is that the intro to this does not have video. I'll have video a little bit later. I have my buddy Ian Carlos Crawford coming on. We're going to talk about our favorite TV episodes and what they mean to us and all that good stuff. But um, <laughs> I was real good this morning. I got up. I, I got the camera ready. I got myself ready. My allergies weren't too bad. Last year when we moved to El Paso, I, I, I was like real excited because I was like, mm, I won't have any allergies. There's no trees anywhere. There's no, <laughs> there's no grass. But actually... Uh, I live in a giant dust bubble, so allergies are worse than ever here. Um, but I, yeah, so I woke up this morning, felt really good, so I put the camera up, did the intro to this episode, and uh, was did, did it in like one take, so that that's pretty rare. I usually have to start over. Um, and then I went and had lunch and, you know, watched a little bit of Vanderpump Rules because <laughs> that fucking show has roped me back in. Um yeah, and if, if you know, you know. And so I'm trying to prepare for the upcoming episodes and the upcoming reunion. I'm, like, so stoked for this damn reunion. So I watched a few episodes of that, and then I came back down here into uh, my little editing bay, and I started editing editing the episode, and um, I realized that the portion I recorded this morning had no audio. So that was fun. And um, <laughs> so we're free recording it right now. I can't be bothered with... with video so it's just audio for the first half of this apologize um again my allergies are real bad too and so like my eyes are puffy now and i'm real stopped up so apologize for how i sound as well um and then the second thing you might notice is that my lovely co-host and husband alistair j Patton, is not here for this episode <laughs> i feel like i always have to preface i feel like every time i come on nowadays i have to preface it with oh my husband's not here he's in the field he's training um but that's just our reality. We're dealing with it. We're living with it. And uh, we take it as it comes. So he will be, he should be home in the next couple of days. Um, I believe tomorrow, but who knows? Who knows what could go wrong out there? And so I don't know. Um, but yeah, so. <laughs> uh, and I had to wait like five minutes because these fucking planes, I guess like the flight pattern is I don't know, I guess it's bad right now, because there was, I feel like there were like a couple planes in a row, just like flying out, because we live right next to an airport, but we are here, we're recording, and you'll have like a Tuesday late night show, you might, I think there there might actually be three episodes this week, um, one tonight, one tomorrow evening, because I'd like to do a news episode, some hot topics, um, because there's a lot going on in the news right now, and then on Friday, just a little fun something, so we'll get to those, but um, yeah, I have my buddy Ian Carlos Crawford coming on a little bit later, and we're going to talk about TV because I've been I've had TV on the brain a little bit lately. Um, Yellow Jackets just premiered, and super stoked about that. The first episode for season two was really really good, actually. Um, uh, if you don't watch Yellow Jackets, I highly suggest getting into it. It's a really really good show. It's got a bunch of it's like a stacked cast, stacked cast. Juliette Lewis is just phenomenal in it. Christina Ricci is wonderful as Misty. Um, and that show just premiered, and so I'm really excited about that. And then, uh, yeah, again, I've been watching a lot of reality TV lately, but also uh, Daisy Jones and the Six. Did anybody read that book by Taylor Jenkins Reid? I, me and Alistair read that one, and we read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. And we love the, both of those books. We love The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. Um, but Daisy Jones and the Six, uh, we read while he was on deployment as well, and it was adapted into a TV show for Amazon Prime. And, like, Reese Witherspoon was was heading the show, and um, she's not in it, but she was like, you know, it, it's her production company, I guess. And so we were real excited about that. But then when the show came out, I just, like, I remember all these, like, little moments in the book that I was really excited for, right? And I'm not usually a person that's like, oh, it has to be so accurate to the book. I understand that things need to sometimes be... Um, be changed as far as like budget goes it's like a lot easier writing a book than it is making a tv show because there are budget constraints with the tv show right whereas in a book you can just write whatever and everything goes um 
But I mean, the book was based in reality, so I figured they could probably fit most of it in there. But I have to say, I'm pretty disappointed in Daisy Jones and the Six TV show. Yeah, there were a lot of moments in the book that I was really looking forward to seeing and seeing how they they put it together. And it just, it didn't hit for me. And all of the moments that were pretty big in the book, I feel like they just kind of glossed over or like went through it really, really fast. Um, and these were like monumental moments in the book, like the them shooting their, their album cover and recording the album and um, Daisy and... Uh, like writing a song about revenge, or not revenge, but writing a song about like regret and regretting this guy and, and this relationship. And Daisy is almost like very manic pixie dream girl in the in the book. <laughs> very much like that, actually. Um, and I think I was, and I was really, really rooting for, so like Riley Keough plays Daisy Jones in the show. And she is, if you don't know, she is the daughter of Lisa Marie Presley, um, rest in peace, granddaughter of Elvis Presley, and so I just figured, oh my gosh, what a perfect, what perfect casting for this show, right? And she was in a movie called Zola that I, I really loved, and she was she was really funny in that one, but she just reads, I don't know if it's directing, I don't know if it's, if it's the script, I just don't know, I don't know if it's her, but she's just not really landed for me as a daisy, um... Daisy's like a kind of an annoying character in the book, but that's kind of why I love her is that she's she's annoying to read through her perspective and like um, read people talk about her and because the whole book is set up like a bunch of interviews about this band, Daisy Johnson the Six, and she just I don't know like Riley Keough is just playing a little flat for me as Daisy. Um, I have the last two episodes I need to watch. I'm waiting on Alistair to get home so we can watch those, but they've like glossed. They've, they've already gone over the shooting, uh, recording the album, shooting the album cover, and those fell really flat for me, and I'm just not really buying the relationship. I think Sam Claflin is like great in this. I think he's wonderful. <laughs> he does look older, um, and I think he's supposed to be playing a lot younger, but it, it, it's whatever. Neither here nor there. Um but I don't know. I just had a little bit more hope for it, and I was, I'm was i pretty disappointed by it. And I'm already really nervous because um, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo is actually being adapted into a, a – I don't remember if it's a movie or TV show. It might be a TV show, but um, – I was nervous when that was announced because I'm like, uh, at first it was like supposed to be on the ABC family, like whatever that turned into, Freebie or, or um, whatever the hell that is now. Um, and I think it's moved by this point. Um, I'm not sure of the update and where exactly it sits, but it makes me nervous like watching this and being like, oh, well, what are they going to do with Seven Husbands? Because it's such a good book and they could do so much with it. And they, they really could make it like must see TV, you know. Um, and I think the doing it as a TV show would probably be work so well for it. But I thought that as well for Daisy Jones and the Six because I'm like, you got multiple episodes, you can really like flesh things out. But that one fell really flat for me, so I'm now I'm like, oh my goodness, please, please, please do Evelyn Hugo justice. But I guess we'll just I don't know. I try not to shit on things too much because there's a lot of people that that work on it, and uh, you know they they put their blood, sweat, and tears into it all their time, and. Uh, <laughs> It, it, sometimes things don't work out. Sometimes what you've envisioned didn't exactly work out. I know that firsthand. Um, but I have a lot of hope for that. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm like in a TV renaissance right now for myself. I've been, for the last few months, I just wanted to watch movies. You know, I've like been really tired of TV. And all the TV shows that Alistair has been trying to make me watch, I'm like, ugh. But I just like can't commit to a TV show right now. But now I'm like, okay, I'm on the, I'm on the, I'm on the train. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to finish the last of us. We got to episode three. Now <laughs> we need to finish the rest of it. That's just so damn sad. Um, but yeah, growing up TV was like movies and TV were really big for me, right? Like scary movies were huge for me growing up, but TV was really big for me too. And I used to watch TV with my mom and that was our like bonding thing. And so we would always watch I think Grey's Anatomy was on Thursdays, maybe. I might be wrong about that. But we, we would watch Grey's Anatomy. I remember when Denny died, and we, we like, stayed up to watch it. And uh, it was, like, a real big deal, and we were real into it. And then, like, Desperate Housewives, all, all of those seasons, we, we watched all of those. I remember those were Sunday nights, and we loved it. Watched it all the way through to the end. Um, and that was our bonding time. 
you know, one of my favorite episodes of like TV in general, like of Desperate Housewives and TV in general is like the tornado episode. I loved the tornado episode. I thought that was so fun and so cool. Like just like I like a situational episode where like, you know, um, you have all these housewives on, on the steer your lane and then you drop a tornado in the middle. What happens? Right. Like I love a concept like that. Um, and then they like went on hiatus for the longest time because I think that was the same year as the writer's strike. And we like couldn't wait for that show to come back. But I always like really and, and we watched Lost a lot, too. Uh, but I always really think of my mom when I think of like TV, like back in the day TV, you know, like 20, 20 something episode, uh, you know, TV shows. And now it's like, you know, 10 episodes. You know what I noticed, though, as I've been watching Vanderpump Rules, rewatching it. Um, <laughs> these seasons are so fucking long. Like, they are obnoxiously long for a reality show. These are like 20-episode seasons. I'm like, damn, I didn't even know they did these anymore, you know? Um, I guess Grey's Anatomy is still like a 20-something episode season, um, and that's still going. I'm like way behind on that. I think I stopped watching after Easy Lift, but um, I don't know. TV has a real special place in my heart, and so my, my buddy Ian Carlos Crawford, he's a writer, and he writes a lot about TV and movies and all of these different things, and so um, I figured I'd bring him on to talk about our favorite TV episodes. Not so much TV shows, but TV episodes, specific episodes, and how monumental they were and the ones that were most impactful for us. So, um yeah, let's talk about Helix Leap real quick, and then we'll come back with that. Uh, if you don't know already, this episode is kindly being sponsored by Helix Sleep. We absolutely love our Helix Sleep mattresses. We have two of them. We have a queen size and a king size. Um, Alistair, every time he goes on one of these like training little exercises or whatever, he comes back, and he like will nap for the entire day. So he's going to come home. I've gotten the bed all ready for him. It looks real nice. Um, it's real, it's going to be real soft because these mattresses are really, really good. And so he's going to pass out immediately. And these mattresses we've had for like nearly three years now, and they've, they've held up so well. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your unique needs. Everybody's different, right? Well, Helix has this sleep quiz that'll match you with the perfect mattress. And it was perfect for us because we could take the quiz as a couple. You know, Alistair is more of a side sleeper. I'm an all over sleeper. Alistair likes a firm mattress. I like my mattress medium. We took the quiz and we were matched with the Midnight Mattress. Now, one great part to all this is that Helix will ship your mattress right to your door for free in the US. It comes rolled up in a box and is super easy to set up, and we've done it twice. And if it makes you nervous to buy something that you haven't tried, well, Helix has a 100 night sleep trial, so you get more than three months to make sure that you absolutely love it. So if you or somebody you know is in the market for a new mattress and you think that Helix sounds right for you, you can go to helixsleep.com slash tequila where you can get 20% off of your mattress and two free dream pillows. And we are back. I am here with my good friend, Ian Carlos Crawford. Um, by now, everybody should know that this is one of my good buddies. I do a horror movie podcast with Ian Carlos Crawford called uh, My Bloody Judy, and sometimes I'm on your podcast, Slayer Fest 98. During COVID... You are a co-host. You are a co-host. A co-host. co-host. <laughs> oh, but during COVID, all we did was Slayer Fest 98, just like... Like, I think that was, like, the beginning of our friendship, so we were just having nonstop Buffy conversations, right? And so, like, that was, we'd do, like, four-hour-long live streams just talking about Buffy, and I'd get real drunk. And, also, so. I'm very charmed by the way you refer to me as, like, your good buddy. Good buddy. My good, I have lots of good buddies, and you're one of my good buddies. I don't have a couple good buddies, but you're one of my good buddies. I say, it better not be an everyone title, dickhead. No, 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 no. Um, how are you doing, though, Ian Carlos Crawford? Uh, I'm all right. I've had a little bit of boy trouble. But... Boy trouble. Oh, well, coffee and tequila is the place for that. We do have a topic to get to, but I want to hear about the boy trouble. Uh, so like I've is been... It the same guys on that I'm thinking of? Yeah, okay. yeah. Zach knows most of this. <laughs> um, so I've been sleeping with the same person since the last little bit. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, they were texting me every day, which is, like, fine. Um, and I think I had even said something to you about that, right? Like, I was like, oh, I'm trying to be casual, but they're texting me every day. So, like, okay. Um, and I will say I started to get a little, like, lose interest going over to their apartment all the time. Mm -hmm. So it was mostly just, like, the same thing, which is, like, fine if it's a hookup. But if we're talking every day, it's like, can we switch it up? Um and you know they were very nice. Uh, you were team. You were on their team as well for me, like telling you about them at first. Mm -hmm. um, and then like, I kind of I, I and I feel like you kind of said this to me too. Like I kind of lost a little bit of interest, right? And then 
it started like there was a day when I could not bottom and they like <laughs> took that as like a weird uh, like they didn't accept like it was like well then don't come over and I was like I mean I well, can still suck your dick I, I remember this actually yeah and like I don't know like, <laughs> I feel like that happened a couple times also it wasn't just like once <laughs> um, but like so then I was like annoyed they were like don't come over because I literally even said in the text I'll still suck yeah. your dick like there are things you can do um, and they said don't bother so whatever sure I was kind of done with them while we were in New York they saw me posting and like text me um, and I kind of was like done with it because that pissed me off so much. And, uh, I forget we were supposed to hang out last weekend. I took 45 minutes to respond to one of their texts and they're like, I made other plans already. I was like, all right. Um, and then after four days text me with my theory was correct. You didn't reach out to me. And I was like, it's been four days. So I was just like, oh, well, I was just thinking of you, Yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. And. They were like, okay, so they text me to say, my theory was right, you haven't texted me, you haven't reached out unless I reach out. And I was like, oh, you know, like, I was thinking of you, I, you know, because it really wasn't like a, ooh, I'm gonna. Mm -hmm. And then they said that I was catching feelings, so that's why they were nervous to talk so to me. So we went through this, like, all last week. I, we were, like, going back and forth that he was, like, showing me the messages and stuff like that. And we were having whole conversations about this. And this guy, what you're not saying is this guy um, fully would, like – this guy's younger, right? And so he acts younger. He acts even younger than he, he is. Um, and so this guy would – was really like, oh, this is only sex casual. This is only sex casual. We're we're like keeping it super casual, you know, no feelings, you know. It's a it's a whatever. You come over to my place. We have sex. That's that's about it, right? But then you don't text him like you just said, <laughs> and he does the thing that young guys do, and I have definitely done this. Where it's <laughs> like, well, I knew it. I didn't text you, and so you didn't. Uh, you didn't. You. I knew I would never hear from you. Um, and then he flipped it up on you. He flipped it up on you at, when, when you're like, oh, I, saw, I thought we were doing casual, right? And he's like, well, you're the one with feelings all the time. And said that I gave him an ulti, that I was basically giving him an ultimatum when I was like giving us, like telling, like saying we should just hang out. Mm -hmm. Because as I, Zach knows, and my fucking therapist knows, like, well, I feel like both you and my therapist and like by the best friend Kim and like other people were like, yeah, I think you need to hang out with him to decide like how you feel because he's texting you every day. He likes you. And, you know, I showed you some of our texts. Like, even yeah. you were like, oh, yeah, he likes you. Um, well, he was texting you every day. He was texting you every day, and he was, like, ask, asking about your day. Like, way beyond sex casual, by the way. Right. Way beyond, like, booty call, anything like that. So he was giving mixed messages here, right? Because then he would also have you... He only ever wanted you to come over to his apartment, right? right. Listen, Ian got really tired of being at his dingy, dark apartment, and which is very fair, okay? <laughs> so we, I, I, I know, I know his other friends were telling him this, his therapist was telling him this. I was telling him, like, listen, get, go over to his place, or, like, after you're, you're done having sex or something, just, like, say, hey, I need to run to Walmart. Do you want to go with me? Just walk around Walmart for, like, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, yeah. and just kind of talk and just hang out and, like, see. Because you weren't sure if you... right. We're feeling just sex casual, or if you were feeling like, yeah. I don't know, you always seemed to, to me that you were more, you weren't really feeling him as like a, a romantic interest, you know, but I, mean, I was just telling you, like, take him out, take him out, go to the yeah. movies, go do different things. This guy would never go do anything outside of the apartment. There was always like a cancellation or, yeah. to be fair, two times I did have to cancel. Um, but like, also, most of, I would be like, let's go to a movie. That's not... Mm -hmm. I feel like going to a movie, if you're texting me every day, isn't wild, right? For me to be like, let's get you a movie. That's not like... I don't think walking around Walmart for 50... you need anything from Walmart? Do you need anything? Right. Do you have, <laughs> you're out of toilet paper over here, by the way. Okay, I'm about to bottom. I need to, you know... Um, let's just make sure you have some stuff for your house. Um, like, you, there's nothing you can go walk around Walmart for 15 minutes and talk about, you know? And just like, so that we don't have to sit inside of your fucking dark apartment. <laughs> just for one night. Just one like, night, I don't want to sit inside a dark apartment. And, like, I just, I don't like the, like, turning it around on me. Because, like, yes. even if if he was like, hey, I don't know what I want, that's reasonable mm -hmm. to say. I don't, that's, I wouldn't be mad. But it's the, like, oh, I would, and then, like, I showed you the text of, like, I was just being nice when I text you. And it's like, 
What? I wasn't asking you to text me. By the way, I don't need this from you, sir. I don't need, you're not doing me any favors here, right? Yeah. Like, I'm already busy. With I text Kim and Zach like, every day, exactly. all day. I don't need you. I have <laughs> people. I have people, right? Um, <laughs> so, now, I mean, are you dropping him, though? What are you, like, what's the status I here? I feel like, so I haven't, I, I need to text him. Um, and now I'm like terrified he's going to watch this, but Does I do need watch, to text him. a coffee listener, I doubt it. I mean, he, he does look at the stuff I post. Um, and he did like a bunch of my posts yesterday. And he liked one of our Just posts. Just don't share the... this. It's okay. Just don't <laughs> share it and we'll be fine. Um, but like, I haven't texted him back, but I have been like, mm, because, which I'm going to tell you, you already know this and everyone, everyone else does not know this. I was going to say everyone knows this. Um, I hadn't had sex in like five years because I am very picky. Yeah. And moving back to the suburbs, it is a dry, dry desert of like, weird 60 year olds and like weird 19 year olds and i don't have interest in either so i'm like but do i want it because the sex is good yeah. it was very we were like doing the same shit over and over again but it was good i i pretend it was not good i told zach <laughs> many specifics i know all this we fuck. won't get into the specifics here at coffee <laughs> yeah. tequila but i know all the specifics Am I allowed to say this man can fuck? Is that too is that too racy he, to say he, on coffee he can, uh, And he folds you in half like a chair, like a lawn chair. I've heard him many times. Hey, you bring that up. That's his. That's his. <laughs> that's his. That's his go to move. He folds you in and half like a lawn chair. <laughs> so it is some of the best sex I've ever had. But like, also, I am forty. I am not nearly as horny as a this younger aged man. Um, but the sex is good yeah. and. I do feel like you like having sex with him, you know, there have been, but the annoying thing is, and I don't know why I get like this. I feel very obligated with shit like this because there were numerous times when I'm like, oh, I don't feel like having sex, mm -hmm. but we haven't had sex in like a week and I don't want to like not have sex with him or him to think I don't want to have sex. So let me go over. There was plenty of times I did that because like, that's how I get with that shit. I don't know why. Um, so I don't know. I'm kind of like, I don't really want to give up the sex, but. Well, then don't give up the sex. And it's that simple, right? Like you can, if he's, if he, if he has now flipped it, right? That you're the one catching feelings and he is just, I, I just ask you about your day just to be nice. I'm just being nice to you. You lonely fucking loser. Yeah, he has no friends. Right. Um, if he really <laughs> wants to be like that, then keep it sex, sex casual. Okay. You don't need to be asking him about his day. You don't need to be, when you're taking your clothes off, you can say, Hey, how was your day? That's about it. Right. Right. You like do it. you don't need to be texting him all the time and stuff like that however this guy from everything that i know is i feel like his pride was hurt probably um and you not texting him for four days because who fucking does that unless you have already caught feelings for right somebody. like um like doing the I'll, I'll not text him for four days challenge and let me see and it was probably like a full week but he only made it to four days before he could say something because that's how we are um <laughs> But he, this is what he's going to do, right? You're going to keep it sex casual. You're going to like pull back on how much you communicate with him. Unless you're just fucking horny and you text him, I'm horny. Um, he's going to pick up on that and he's going to be like, I could totally see him. Be, I'm not just a penis, Ian. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a person. You got to ask me about me. You don't ever ask me about me. He's going to do the, the feelings thing. He's just going to ask about feelings. I mean, I was getting texts about his job every day. There was like a week when ever, like, and you know, fine. He was having like a terrible week texting yeah. me all about work. And like, that's not keeping it casual. If you're like texting me that you're depressed and like text me that they, like the, the one day at work, like very specific things. Like, I don't know. That's not right. That's not keeping it casual. Well, and so this guy had like a very big thing happen in his life recently. Yes. Um, like a good thing, really great yeah. thing for him. Right. And he wanted you to be part of that. Yeah. That is not sex casual. It just is right. not. Um, so I think this is a young guy who got his pride hurt and and does not want to admit that he probably has feelings also. And so, so when you keep it sex casual, we watch and see. He's going to come back to you and he's going to be like this. Just, you know, you're a dickhead, blah, 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 blah. I, that's, that's the thing. I yeah. know that he's going to be like, I'm going to look like an asshole because it'll be turned around. You're going to look like an asshole either way because you look like an asshole this last time too, True. right? <laughs> like I, the messages I was reading from you is these long messages from him and then and Ian's like, I, I thought this was what you wanted, right? This is <laughs> Zach literally saw the text. Like, yes, it's, it's I, and even Zach, like, I feel like you were like, you're being too nice to him <laughs> because, like, this guy really, you're, you're going to tell me I'm catching feelings. Are you kidding me? And he posted you on his story, 
Ooh, he did. He did like he, do a subtweet of me on his story. Yes, very much knowing you're gonna see the story and like like this is fucking college. Is this college? Is it high school? You know, <laughs> calm your shit. Let, let me tell you this. I'm, I'm very um, interested in the updates. We will have to see where it goes. But like, <laughs> I I wonder if he will even let you just do sex cut. Right. right. I'm wondering. Yeah. <laughs> because I like. I'm like. I don't want to have another talk. And <laughs> another talk. Listen. I am. I am. I am. My marriage gets so monotonous sometimes. It gets so boring. But I would. I would never trade being married to my husband for having to go out and like deal with fuckboys ever again okay and having to like <laughs> navigate a dating scene and you know th th like the stupid shit of not being able to say if you have feelings or not it just sounds it sounds terrible Ugh, it's fucking exhausting are you kidding that's why uh my i recently learned that i may inherit my parents house and that's why i told zach i was like oh you and alice are gonna move in i told my best friend kim her and her daughter to move in i'll be well, i'll this be guy happy gonna move in too he's gonna catch feelings real fast <laughs> when he hears you have a house he's gonna say out of this dingy apartment into your basement baby <laughs> like i would much rather just live with my best friends and like okay i go have sex sometimes that would there be you go. much more fulfilling for me go, have sex, like, go just have sex sometimes Honestly, like if he just wants to keep it sex casual then you can be up for that challenge too you can do it also right you don't have to lose your fuck toy and he he doesn't have to lose the hole Right, but this means I you guess. can go on grinder too, because this guy also. <laughs> I was I was just about to yes. So I when keep Ian going goes back on to grinder, that. when Ian goes on grinder, this guy hits him up and will like message him on grinder and will say, um, "Oh, I thought you weren't on this thing yes. anymore." Why would he care if it exactly. right? Like I, uh, exactly. Uh, um, and I know I'll get a lot of that, so I probably have to block him on Grinder. <laughs> well, now, now when you go on Grinder, he's just gonna be like slut, slut pig, <laughs> whore. <laughs> but the sex is good. <sighs> well, I can't give up a good dick, right? And I'm very like, I know some people are like, oh, don't like give it, don't like let someone who sucks like have it. But I'm more of like, okay, but like, if he sucks, then give it to him. Yeah, I mean that's the point of sex. Right? Like... <laughs> that was a joke. Um, <laughs> we, I'm so happy to have everybody listening to your boyfriend troubles, and I'm happy to listen to your voice. Not troubles. boyfriend, not boyfriend. Oh, boy, not boyfriend. Yeah, I forgot. Mm, no, <laughs> not boyfriend. If he is listening, he's going to get real mad now. You're going to get a long message about that. Your co-host said that he, I was your boyfriend. I'm already stressed. <laughs> your boyfriend. <laughs> but I want everyone to know, this is how Zach and I, this is normally how we talk off. Air? I feel like yeah. it's usually a lot of me telling you some ridiculous story. Pretty much. I mean, we have a topic here, but um, <laughs> I live for the drama. So it's probably. I, I am Zach's like TV. personal reality. I was about to say I'm your personal reality show. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> one day we'll make we'll make one of them. Our, our <laughs> entire friend group. <laughs> um, yeah, but I. Uh, what what is the topic for today? I I forgot what I even brought you on for. Zach. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Zach texts me to say most Im the the episodes mm -hmm. of television that are most important to us. Yeah, because I've been like kind of getting back into TV a little bit lately, um, and I just miss the golden age of TV. You know, things coming on every week, commercials. I miss commercials. I know I no, get cable, but I don't mind. Like that's I don't mind Hulu with commercials. That's the only reason I haven't upgraded. So I don't mind it. TV really was. Uh, almost a center it was more of a like as in my adult years i feel like movies are more of a center point to my life now but like when i was younger and growing up it was tv and like i had my shows that i watched with my mom like we watched desperate housewives every sunday um from beginning to beginning to end um we watched uh shit what a gray's anatomy we watched we had all of our shows i watched buffy i watched uh i started to watch lost gave up on that one i even watched the fucking sopranos you know like tv was like huge for me um and i feel sad that i don't watch tv as much anymore and, but it's just like there's something missing with tv now okay versus when we but had also TV. i think there's just too much yes <laughs> i don't mean also like, that i'm mad but it's yeah. like you I, when I was younger, I would read Entertainment Weekly cover to back, like memorize it. I would read every single like they would have like write ups, all the new shows coming this season. And it wasn't, you know, an 85 page book, which it would have to be now. It was like, you know, a section of the magazine mm -hmm. and it would be literally listing every show that was starting. And there would be like, you know, 10 or 20. Right. Yeah. And I would like read all about them. I would know everything about every show that was premiering, even if I didn't like 
have any interest in watching it, I would want to know about it. Like what mm -hmm. celebrities were in it. And like, I would be able to tell you about shows that I hadn't watched. I mean, I still can do that, but now it just feels like every platform and every like even channels and whatever has like 85 different fucking shows. And it's just yeah. impossible to keep up with. I don't know. I really want to get into TV again because I think I just, I'm like really craving the, the longer journey, but I just don't know what's out there for me right now, I guess. Like Yellow Jackets is really good, but all of these are just like exciting watches. I need something that is going to like settle deep within me, lay eggs, and like just completely and just burst like, out of your stomach. <laughs> just burst out of my stomach, right? <laughs> I well, I do think so. I think I've said this before about the the Netflix Marvel shows that I did like Punisher, which like I don't like Punisher. Punisher shouldn't be a show I like. I thought it was fucking fantastic. And the best thing they did was they actually have a standout episode. And I feel like a lot of shows now don't have like a singular standout episode. It's more yeah. just a long plot, which like is fine, but yeah. the standout episode really wins. And like, for me, the pilot episode of Jessica Jones and this random episode of Punisher are the only episodes I could tell you the beginning and end of for any of those Marvel Netflix shows, because this Punisher episode is like this big thing happens with like a Senator and it's like the police are investigating everyone and everyone tells the story a little bit differently and they show everyone's version of the story. And I think yeah. that's cool. And like, I feel like with these shorter seasons and with like everything being bingeable, we don't get like, they don't care about a standout episode. I completely agree with that. I completely agree with that. And it's because, and, and this is why we're talking about episodes right now is that, is that um, sometimes you just need a single episode. Like you need yeah. an overall story that you're connected with and you're connected with the characters. The characters feel like your family or you're connected to the characters for whatever reason, right? But you're not wanting, you don't need to go through the entire journey right this second, but you want to go to one specific episode like the body, okay? Right. And you can just do that, right? But I feel like a lot of shows are lacking that. Like even WandaVision, love WandaVision, so amazing. But I kind of have to watch the whole thing, you know. Yeah. I can't really like single out an episode, and it does like something for me in an isolated way. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to think. Like I, I guess Stranger Things did get pretty close to that. Like I think I do think the episode where uh, running up the hill first like saves Max, right? I think that's, but that's pretty great. That's the but only still, one I could, yeah. And even still, that's kind of a moment rather than the episode, yeah. and the episode is still connected to, like, it's right. very intrinsically connected to the rest of the episodes, right? Like, I, I would say Stranger Things, I think they do at least try to not, yes. they try to make it like, oh, this episode has, like, a specific thing, it just doesn't always, like, I mean, you and I love it, so we're not saying it's bad, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. I don't know that it always works as, like, a standalone episode. Like I think that's just where we are with, with stories right now, and that's why they brought them down to, like, eight episodes. It's because you can tell the entire right. – like, it's like one long eight-hour episode, basically, yeah. and you kind of have to watch it as such. Let's talk about some, some episodes of TV that just were really either formative for you or momentous or or just, like, what made the most impact in, also, in I wanna, your life. I want to prepare you. I feel like my list Good. sucks. I made a list, and it's long, but I feel like – Yours is going to be better. Mm. Because I wanted to narrow it. But I, I wanted to take it down from just TV shows to like specific right. episodes because I feel like that says a lot about a person and what lessons you got from those specific TV shows, right? So um, give me give me your first one. I, if I don't also know this, it, you have to explain it to me. <laughs> it's so predictable. <laughs> Jesus Christ. My my first one on the Both list. Both of them, <laughs> Is Buffy becoming <laughs> becoming part one and two? Yes, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. The entire Buffy season two is Shakespeare. It's a giant Shakespeare play. the The story is, but there's also like killed by death and go fish that are like uh, diversions. Shakespeare. <laughs> um, but those episodes are really important to me and really like pivotal to me. It's like all of Buffy is pivotal because that's like what made me want to be a like creator and like mm -hmm. write. That I I don't think I would have wanted to be a writer if it weren't for. <laughs> Buffy and J.D. Salinger, which is do with that what you will. But those are like the two things that made me want to be a writer. And becoming becoming part parts one and two, I think the show, of course, has a lot of high highs. But I think that's its first like super high high. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Kendra dying is such a big deal because it's another vampire slayer. And like, you know, Buffy fails at the end of episode one. Like she fails kendra yeah. dies 
Willow and Xander get put in the hospital. Giles gets kidnapped. Like she fails. And I think that's really important that a hero can mess up, right? Like she fell for whatever the trap was. She went to see Angelus. They went and attacked her friends. And that slow motion run is very important to me because it's iconic. And the monologue over it, like it's wild that that's a character we never see again because yeah. it's like one of the best. They do that. They do I, that sometimes, though. We're covering Angel right now, and they also do that with Angel. And I'm just like, it really drives me insane. The Buffy Angel romance really is what solidified Buffy the Vampire Slayer um, as a show that people needed to watch, that people were yeah. talking about, right? And it was this this love story between Buffy and Angel, um, culminating in that season with this like tragedy to the Shakespeare play. <laughs> well, right? and like it's it's so funny because my mom reads romance novels right mm -hmm. and like buffy kind of shaped the type of romance novels she would read moving forward oh really because like my mom almost exclusively reads romance about like you know i bought her last year for christmas i think i found one that's like uh, a like demon that's good that came from hell and the woman falls in love with them in his human form and my mom loved it i couldn't even tell you the name of it but like, like anything like that that like could be something taking place in the Buffy universe. That's like the romance my mom loves. Mm. And she like loved Buffy and Angel. She loved Buffy. Like my mom isn't usually one who's like, no, 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 it has to be. She's like, great. There's a romance. I love it. Like yeah. she just loved all the romance. And I think that's like what shaped what she liked moving forward. I think uh, when I was, when I was first watching those episodes, when I first started watching those episodes and I would rewatch them um, and growing up, it was all about the love story for me. I always loved the love story. I loved, I, I, I loved them embracing right before she like stabs him and sends him, you know, into hell and all the, that dimension and, and all of that. And I was always hyper-focused on the romance, but as I got older and now that I'm, you know, getting to the end of my twenties, I, I just had never really, it wasn't until really like entering the social media space where people were talking about Buffy the Vampire Slayer that I ever really considered the um, the coming out story that's in those episodes also, right? It's like it's like a, a long coming out story, and I just never had thought about it. But it did like I, I feel like I I recognized it subconsciously, but not until I heard people talking about it and 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 you know sort of making those connections that I ever thought about it. And now every time I think about it, it's like the love story to the side, and it's all about the coming out story and Buffy in the kitchen with her mom. And, and she says, um, I, I, uh, I have to go. This is what I, I don't know, whatever the big, the big dialogue is. And the mom's saying, um, I have to go save the world out, again. Yeah, <laughs> if you walk out that door, don't think about coming back. And, you know, she gives him her look and she walks out and it's, you know, in essence, Buffy is coming out to her mom and it's just go well. I like, it's fucking good. Right. It's like what shows were doing shit like that. Well, and the thing that the line that I just quoted, it's like silly, but it works, right? Mm -hmm. Like in context, it like it is ridiculous, but it works, right? And it makes sense. Like she's yeah. pissed. She's exhausted. She's got to go do this shit. Fuck you, mom. Also, my mother never forgave Joyce Summers for that. And my mom will bring that up all the time. Like a Puerto Rican can hold a grudge. Yes. A Hispanic loves holding a grudge, especially in my family. As Zachary knows, I will hold a grudge. Um, and like... We were watching a rerun the other day on Fuse, and it was like a season one episode. My mom literally was like, "Oh, that's her stupid mother. I hate that woman. I don't like <laughs> that she kicked Buffy from the out of one her house. season two episode. She died, Mrs. Carlos Crawford. She <laughs> dies. Like, okay, she got what was coming to her. She got the karma. My mom didn't <laughs> think the body was that sad because she hated Joyce so much. <laughs> well, okay, speaking of the body, that's this is the first one that I listed on my on my list. Right, Buffy is just full of of. Uh, just moments that had or episodes that had such an impact on my life. And like you said, really, really pushed me into, into wanting to create stories, not just writing, yeah. but create stories all the way around. Right. Like I would, I would, uh, I have like all these notebooks that have, that's the, the, the this was the first show that I ever learned what an arc was. And so I'd write what up my arcs and, and, you know, come up with all of these stories and, and seeing the body was the first time I ever saw in, um, in any sort of, anything um something that covered grief as, as hard and as realistic as as 
this episode did, right? And so my yeah. first ever, or we've talked about this before, but my first ever uh, experience with grief was when my granny died and I just didn't understand. There's just so much confusion when somebody dies and you just can't really comprehend that they're not there anymore, that they yeah. won't be there anymore, right? Um, and that you'll never get to talk to them again. And that's just like something, the permanence of it is so, it's really hard to understand and it takes a lot of processing. Um, yeah. And the body, just the episodes after the body, I wish covered it a little bit a little bit more like they do have one episode where you know don tries to bring, bring joyce back but like i wish it would have been a little bit heavier than it was but i understand why it wasn't because the body was such a heavy episode so like sarah michelle geller we open the episode and she gets home and she's got this like it's all like stripped down all super simplified she's got this like ponytail this red shirt that is just like so simple and so basic and she just like and, and, and I don't want to talk about her body or anything, but even seeing her like her collarbone through that shirt just made her seem weaker than a vampire slayer. You know, like it made, she looked so weak. She looked in small this. too. Yes. She, and she is small, yeah. but I feel like that's one of the few scenes where she looks small. And it, I mean, yeah. of course, that's on purpose because it's she can't do anything. And, and like then the like, shirt's coming like over her fingers and she does look really tiny. And so she finds the body of her mother on the couch. And like, if you have not seen this episode... And it, this, it, even if you're not into anything like this, not into like supernatural fantasy or anything like that, the body is an episode of television that I feel like everybody needs to see. Yeah. Um, and she Absolutely. finds the body of her mother, and we just watch this <clears throat> long shot of her finding the body, trying to wake her up. She's not woken up. She calls the police. Um, throws up on the floor. Like has has, and it's not like intensely dramatic. It's like very stripped down, very simple, very like. Oh, I don't even, I don't know how, like, I, I the the image that comes to mind is, like, right after she throws up and she goes and opens the door and she's, here's all the kids outside and, like, her lips are, like, really dry and white and, and it's, like, over, the shot's overexposed and that's just kind of how that feels when it almost feels like an out, out of body experience and I think they did such a great job with just that opening of portraying that and then when we go into the rest of the episode we start getting everybody else's reactions and it's also it differs so much right um anya's monologue brings me to tears every fucking time i watched that and she is she was so like buffy's buffy finding the body in that reaction is always just like a tour de force performance, right? And I, I have to marvel at it, but it's Anya's monologue that really channeled any experience I've ever had with death. Like not understanding why I can't talk to this person ever again, or this person will never have fruit punch again, or let, you know, brush her hair again, yeah, or yeah. do all of the things that this person did day to day. And it's insane that like somebody came up with this, but it's also not insane because this is what we go through like all the time. You know, people go through this all the time. I mean. Listen, I could cry. I was about to cry just listening to you describe it because that's how like and like not to be grim, but like and I think I've told you this before, like I finding my friend like dead in his bed mm -hmm. is like uh, all I could think of was the body, which is bananas. All I could think of was the two things I kept going back to actually were Buffy the body. And I had just read um, Joan Didion Year of Magical Thinking, which is all about her husband dying. Yeah. And that the opening is so bleak because it's like. She's talking about how happy they are. And he abruptly fucking dies. Um, and like he dies, he's dying in their apartment. And that's like the beginning of the book. Um, and I just kept thinking of those two things because the mundane shit is so real, especially when yes. you find a fucking body. Like we had to call the police. We had to wait for the police. We went outside to wait and there were kids playing and like out front of our building and like our super came by and was like, uh, what's going on? And I had to tell our super and it was like awkward and like, you have all these interactions that like in these little things you need to do. And I had to tell my roommate, hide our weed before the police get here. Like shit you have to think of that's so stupid and mundane. And like, I went home that night and watched the body. Like when I, yeah. I got driven back to my parents' house. So I don't want to, no one wanted to be in that apartment. And like, I watched the body cause it was so like realistic and like, it felt like, okay, good. I can see my hero go through this. And like, she makes it, you know what yeah, I mean? Like she lives through exactly it. it. Because she is our hero, right? And, like, Buffy was, has been my hero since a very, very young age. So right after my granny died, I also remember watching this episode to try and process it, right? And relating to different things. And, and uh, again, very specifically Anya's, Anya's monologue. Yeah. And this episode has, has worked its way into any story that I ever create now, right? Like, I like a really bleak ending. I like a really bleak, like, something happening in it. Um, 
and and I always write something bleak or I always imagine something really bleak and it's this episode that I have in mind about like well fit the mundane in there right fit the things that make it super bleak is that this this thing is happening before you that's really big to you but the entire world keeps moving and nobody is like it's not big to anybody yeah. else you know yeah but these neighbors they it, it wasn't big to them that Joyce died you know um, right. but it was really big to her and really personal to her and so I always just even subconsciously will write that into or like create that as part of any story I ever do. And so this, this is probably the most impactful episode of TV that I've ever experienced. Um, but another one, are we going, how many Buffy, how many Buffy episodes? I limited myself to three Buffy okay, episodes. Okay, I have chosen. I have chosen two. We can do chosen. We'll go through Buffy real quick. Uh. <laughs> well, at least we had one overlapping. You know what? At least we're keeping to our brand. Um, <laughs> chosen is just... I want you to know, I literally was like, Zach will murder me if this is all Buffy. I need to make sure it's not all Buffy. <laughs> I murder myself. Um <laughs> Chosen was just one of those one of those episodes that I remember watching and and just it like just filled me with a sense of power. Yeah. But like and again, just like the body, anytime I create any stories or anything like that, if it has an epic finale or anything, this is in my head. I mean, if there's a person that earned at least a like I am going to live ending, whether you consider that a happy ending or whatever, it's Buffy, right? Like Buffy earned that shit. Yeah, everything. So she I have one other everything. Buffy episode. Do you okay, have another go one? For it. I do not. So, and this actually, what you just said about Chosen, I feel like these are like sister episodes because Graduation Day parts one and two, yeah. specifically part two. I often think of get the kids, and then the kids are just fucking running yes. straight towards the vampires. Like that's like it fills me with a sense of power. Like there's there's so yeah. many episodes in this. Like I could even say that about um about the gift, right? Like I I also tried to like cut out the Buffy episodes just because I already had two on here, but like so many of them, right? Like the Buffy, the vampire slayer was so good at a finale, like yeah. a grand finale. That show there, was there just, isn't a bad finale. It's yeah. fun. It was just so fun. And that's like their first big battle. Not in terms of like, of course, Buffy's fight against Angelus was like more personal, but this is like big in the terms of there are a shit ton of yes. people there. Um, and there's just like, I don't know if you remember when the Parkland shooting happened and those kids did like a, the town hall with certain politicians. Yes. And like, I, I kept thinking that. of Buffy graduation day. I was like, fuck, these kids are like really brave. They're like willing to do all this. Like they went through this trauma and I just kept thinking of Buffy. Like I, that's what I always want in a finale is like everyone fighting together. Mm -hmm. Let's do well, it. Even I if love we like each other. Part, right. It's like the fighting together is I love when Buffy's like, I can do this by myself. Everybody, please here. Let me go. We all kind of know something's weird at this school, okay? Would you tell? Would you think it's weird if I told you the mayor's going to be turning into a big snake? And, and need you need to, to have a him? crossbow? Like. Yeah. And somebody's like, didn't you spend some time in a mental institution? I don't know if I should follow this. Um, God, Zach, you'd be like, but don't give Ian a crossbow. <laughs> uh, don't do it. Don't do it. Just give him, give him a stake. Um, no, the power, the power in that and the sort of everybody joining together is also, again, yeah. when I think of finales and think of like any final battle I would ever love to write in like a fantasy series, I I think of stuff like that. The Sopranos finale, season six, episode 21, Made in America. This one, um, and it's not, even, that it's, it's not even just because of the entire episode. I, I actually don't like the entire episode all that much, but it's the ending. And the ending is like one of my favorite endings on TV show history. And again, it's when I'm creating stories, I love the sort of like abruptness or sort of like unexpected that this ending gives. And so I'll think about this sometimes. Um and you think so about that ending sometimes. The ending is, yeah, like Tony Soprano like meets up with his family at at, the, at, at this diner, and and his daughter's late, and and then she shows up, and uh, when she walks through the door, he like looks up at her, and then the screen goes black. Right, and I remember watching it on TV with my parents, and I hadn't watched The Sopranos up until then. So like, I started well, watching. That was your Sopranos. first episode. I start yes, and I started watching Sopranos right after this because I was like, what the fuck is this? Um, because I remember it's cutting to black and my parents getting so mad and my dad getting like, you know, like cussing and stuff. like It's like this fucking cable, you know, and like we, this is a fucking <laughs> finale and I, it shouldn't be like this. Um, Cause it went black for a good, like few seconds. Um, and then people kind of just like started realizing that that's, that was it. That was it. Yeah. That was the ending. Uh, and I just thought that was so brilliant and I've never been able to get that out of my mind. I could see where I would be pissed. Yeah if I had watched the whole series and that was like, I could see where I might not like that. Mm -hmm. Um, 
like I might feel like unfulfilled, but I do think it's cool. But I do also, I can understand someone loving it, someone hating it. I don't really have yeah. an opinion just because like, I think it's a cool thing, but I probably would have a bigger opinion if it I It really is it. one of those polarizing endings. Like you either love yeah. it or hate it. There's not a whole lot of in the middle. Next on my list, we're speaking of polarizing endings. The Lost finale is very important to me. And the Lost finale, more so than any Buffy episode, is the nerd hill I will die on that everyone is fucking wrong about. And this is me. This is me, the guy who you think is wrong about it. I watched Lost maybe until, I want to say season four, but it might not have even been the entire season four. I remember Charlie dying. That must have been season three, right? I think so. Yes, I, I don't I remember know. Lost watching well a I little bit after that, and then because my Lost was one I, I started with my mom too, and we would like because we would watch our ABC shows together. I started Lost with my mom. My mom yes. gave up. She fucking hated it after. Season well, we two. did too. We did too. <laughs> <laughs> so we gave up, and I would check in every now and then. But when the finale comes, so I'll always check in for a finale. And so when the finale came, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. But I was like, okay, they all died. They're dead. All of them. They're dead. <laughs> So I will tell you, and even the writers have said this, so I know that this is like my interpretation is true only because the writers said it was um, <laughs> and not just like being a dick. They said like it is everyone lived their life. And when they met in the afterlife, they all came together. So like if I died now and you die in 20 years, we would still be it's the afterlife. So nothing matters. So no. it's like. The time in the afterlife is the same, and we're coming together at the same time. Because, so what like, happened? Time in the has Lost no meaning. Finale, in the really, is it was all in Jack's mind, and he none of this really happened, and he died, and they all died. Every time someone says they were dead the whole time, the finale they was the stupid. I get a fucking nosebleed because I'm like, you didn't watch the show because it's not what the finale was, <laughs> and like it's very obvious. And I would not have liked the finale if because I don't love a religion. I hate a religion. A thing that I like about it is when Jack is at his father's coffin, the stained glass window behind him has symbols from like every different religion in it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I can like be okay with it because it's like, good, we're not saying Christianity. We're not saying specific religion. We're saying, look, there's symbols of every religion in this church. Yeah. That's not a real church. Wouldn't A Christian church wouldn't have, you know, these other symbols. So and I just about, like a coming about, together. Yeah, like what about um, Jack being dead the whole time? Did you love about this finale? <laughs> I, Why is it so impactful? <laughs> so Jack and Locke, who I did not like. I didn't like Locke as a character. I didn't like through most of it because he was such an asshole. But like Locke turns evil because of, I think he's inhabited by the smoke monster. I couldn't even tell you the specifics. They have a really cool fight in the rain. It's very cool. And the ending is Jack dies, but he dies saving everyone. So they have gone back to the island. They need to get off it again, so it's about to sink. Like, it's going crazy. It's separating, blah, blah, blah. The plane, I don't... Again, I don't even know Lost as well as I know Buffy, but I just love the ending so much, and I love a full circle. We have, I do want to go back and, and finish that show. Me and Alistair, like, started it again, and we made it... I know, I was so excited when you two. did. And then I think that was around the time we were starting to move, though. So we just like fell off of it. But like it, we we absolutely want to finish it because um, Alistair has finished it and has a lot of opinions on that finale, too. It is what, also one of his favorite shows and one favorite finales. Um, American Horror Story Season uh, 2 Asylum Episodes 12 and 13 Continuum and Madness Ends. I fucking love these these both of these episodes. Um you're not a big fan of Asylum, but I fucking love Asylum. I think Asylum is so good. I think Jessica Lange in Asylum is so good. I love the character of Lana Winters, by, played by Sarah Paulson. I think Evan Peters is so good. And especially in these last two episodes, it gives me all of the... Um, so when I was younger, I would write all of these stories about like somebody's... like I would write like... I wrote like 20 like my life things and on the cover would be like an old person talking about their life, you know, and that would be the, the, whatever the story was. I love shit like that. And so like these two episodes are that, you know, we are, we are catching up with Lana Renters uh, her career all the way until she's like, I don't, I guess she's like 80 in the finale. Um, and she talks about, you know, just, she catches us up. Right. Um, I think the acting is so good. I think, uh, Jessica Lang, just her fucking ending as Sister Jude is, is so, that's powerful to me. That is so powerful. And it's so bleak. It's dark. And I love a bleak and I love a dark. And, you know, it, um, I have this like 
this one tier for all of my bleak, dark sort of stories. And this fits in that along with like Revolutionary Road and shit like that. Like this feels very Revolutionary uh -huh. Road for me. Um, I went out and got drunk after I saw that movie because it was too depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I was like, oh, this is art. Um, I just think these, these two episodes are so cool. Uh, I love... Uh, what else do I love? I Remind me. The whole story. Now I'm realizing I'm confusing. I was like, oh yeah, Jessica Lang, she does the naughty pine. That's Coven. What's her That's end? Coven. I go. So Lana goes back for her, her, right? Her ending her. is so. Uh, if you remember that uh, Jessica Lang's sister Jude was locked up in the asylum eventually, yeah. right? And Lana Winters went back for her, but Sister Jude had died, and so. Sister Jude wasn't actually dead. She was given a new name so that nobody okay. would find her there. Um, but Evan Peters went and got her because he saw her there when he was visiting his wife, Alma. And so he brought her home. And by then, her brain was, like, so melted and, and, and just, like, the, the place really took a toll on her that she was insane. And even though she had been so evil, um, and this is always, like, really hot-button topic for people, right? Is like, if somebody is so evil and shows you so much evil, should you forgive and and give compassion to that person and this takes the root of like yes we take her home we i know yes i already see you smiling I was we like, take tell her me what home. my answer is zach we take her I say, home peace, and bitch. We, uh, <laughs> we show her kindness in her last day as she ends up getting sick and she dies right um and and she has like i don't know if it's really a redemption i i think it's lack of redemption just short of redemption right she's never really redeemed but she like she okay wait and I don't even know if she realizes anything either. I don't know if she realizes love, realizes like the errors of her ways or anything. But I wait, think, yeah. What is the? I thought it was Lena Winters that saves her. Because what's that? I'm picturing a scene when she's interviewing the sister, and she like looks like a crazy old lady, <laughs> and, and she's like in a room. That's just like what we all do is like you know when we're having a fake argument in the shower by ourselves, right? It's not real. It didn't happen. Oh, um, she's imagining it. She was talking about it, and she's like, "That's the story I wanted. That's what I was envisioning, oh, okay. and it didn't happen." Um, I just love the. I do think of, it's a good finale. It's that it's helps. so good, and you know that finale was written by uh, Tim Minear. Is it Minear? Minear. That makes sense that Ryan Murphy didn't write it because it's the only American Horror Story finale that I think is like genuinely good. That's the one my mom likes too. My mom hates them bitches. She hates shows like that. Um, uh, Ryan Murphy wrote the one right before it, which is also what I include in this continuum. Um, the Magicians. I have the episode where my tattoo comes from that I have matching with my best friend, Kim. We've been best friends for over 25 years. It's her idea. It's not that I would... Like I got a Magician's tattoo before a Buffy one. It's not that like... It's more like about the friendship. So the episode it comes from is one of my favorite episodes. One of my favorite episodes of the show. Mm -hmm. That I constantly wish you and Alistair would watch the show because I know you would love it. Uh, um, if you just made I it past be bothered. Season, um, I actually was going to tell you this weekend and be like, oh, can I show you a bunch of episodes that <laughs> you should watch? Because um, you did say you would do that with me once. Um, it's... It's a musical episode, and they are the only show that did musical episodes almost as good as Buffy. Um, it's like they trap; they have to find their friend. They're in this like other magical realm where like the friend is like high and wants everyone wants it to be a musical. So it's like it has to be fun. And if it's not fun, then everyone tries to kill you. So it's like his fun meter has to be at the top. So they end up doing a bunch of musical numbers, and like it's a good episode. But then at the end, the main character Quentin. It's to get there. They're on a quest to get all the keys. This is the unity key. They realize that it's in this magical realm. That's why they're there. It's like the key's there, but so is their friend is trapped there. And I don't even, I couldn't even specifically tell you the conceit of how this happens, but all the characters have not been together the entire season. They're all separate. It's like Quentin and Alice and Katie are in one spot. Margo and Elliot, my favorites, um, are in a different like world where they are being banished and killed. They are in a boat that is going to like float off a uh, like cliff and kill them because they've been banished. But at the end of the episode, Quentin, suddenly everyone, they like touch the key and they can all hear each other's voices because they're all best friends. Mm. And it's like the whole conceit of getting the unity key is they all have to do something together. So, and I just, I could cry just thinking about it and Quentin, the, the weird thing is the magicians did the like magical hand things before the MCU did because the show came out before 
any of the magic stuff in the MCU happened. So like the way they do magic is very like, ooh, I do like a move hand movement or like yeah. do something with my hands. He does a cool thing and he's like, just go with it. Everyone has to sing. And he puts all the lyrics in their brains and they all sing David Bowie's Under Pressure. I don't know if this it, episode is getting me. <laughs> and it makes me cry so much because I'm, our friend Summer Bischel has one of my favorite lines in the entire series because they're like, are you kidding? We're going to die. And he's like, we have to sing to get this key. And before they start singing, she goes, great. We'll enjoy our death screams, I guess. But then like still partakes yeah. in it. That's everything I ever want from like a everyone coming together and so like a togetherness. Because I've noticed a lot of your uh, the choices have been about together. Oh yeah, almost all of mine are almost. Yes. Well, that's a good like through line. That's saying something. It's kind of it's kind of bringing us full circle into a theme here, right? What we love. What's next um, on your list? I have one more before we can kind of wrap up. I guess May Day. It's an episode of The Handmaid's Tale, season three, episode thirteen, the finale. This is, and you you're not a big Handmaid's Tale person, so you don't really watch Handmaid's Tale. But this is the episode where June Osborne. Uh, uh, she has this plot for, for a majority of the season um, to start getting the children of Gilead out and like over to Canada. She's what really wants to save these children, right? And so she like starts plotting with, with one of the commanders to like, get a plane and they're going to get these kids on a plane and they're going to send the plane to Canada, right? Um, and I, there's just – she does it. She does it. And she's supposed to get off get, – get, get on the plane at some point too. But so the big battle happens, all of these things, she gets mm -hmm. shot, um, doesn't end up getting on the plane, but the plane takes off and the kids get to Canada and the the plane lands. Um, people get, uh, 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 start walking on seeing all these kids. And it's just like, I cry every time that I, I watch this episode. And it's because, um, I, I really love a bleak ending. I love, I just love bleakness because it helps me process my own stuff, right? Um, but I also really love to see my hero win, you know? And I love a, a my heroes are usually females and whatever the psychology is there. Buffy's my big hero. Gay, gay, that's the psychology. Gay, gay, gay. gay. My, 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 gay. my, um, well, I think it's a lot of daddy issues too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the uh, I, Buffy's my hero. I love to see her win. But June is also my hero, and she's a really flawed hero, and she's not like perfect at all. And I really love a hero like that who's really flawed, which is like Buffy. Um, and this is just the episode where June, like, because every season up until now, she's had like little wins. She's been able to accomplish this, 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 but she's never like made it to manage to get out. She's like she's gotten her baby out, but she isn't able to like. All of these different things, right? And she keeps getting beat down, beat down, beat down. And this is the episode where she gets her big win and, like, saves all of these kids from a life inside of Gilead where they would grow up and the girls would be married off at 13 and have to have starving babies. And yeah. um, it's just so powerful. And this show is so stressful and so hard to watch. And it is so dark. And it's, like, from episode to episode, season to season, it just gets... It leaves you real depressed, right? But this one was really like a, a shining moment. I think this is probably the best finale within the show. So that's why I love I, it. I watched one episode of that show and it made me cry. And I was like, I don't need to watch this because it will make me cry too well, much. Well, that one made me cry too, but it's in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> I just have to say my honorable mentions real quick, the Shit's Creek finale, because I feel like David often and he gets a happy ending. Yeah. Um, and uh, the episode of Will and Grace where Jack comes out to his mom and it's a big deal. And everyone's like, how doesn't your mom know? Never seen that, but I have seen the Shit's Creek finale. I got a Shit's Creek shirt on right now. So perfect little, little something for it. I, love, I just love David. David's great. Um, and I love all of his episodes with his boo. You know, those are always really good episodes um i don't know but like tv is really just the long form content that you can get invested in your characters you can that you you can play so much with tv right you can you can yeah. do so many cool things and it's it's they do there are shows out there who, who are doing great great things right but i feel like it just there was something about newness back then where people were you know uh, the culture was shifting and people were doing things for the first time and, and showing experiences that were more hush hush. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You had your first abortion episodes or your first, uh, your first, like learning about gay people episodes. And like, you don't really have that anymore. And I'm kind of like, you know, what, are we, how, what are we learning now? I don't know. Uh, I guess we're going to wrap up here. Make sure you guys let us know what your favorite episodes are. What, what were the most impactful episodes of television to your life? and why and uh 
yeah, give us all your thoughts down in the comments below. If you are listening on podcast platforms, make sure you give us a five-star review. And uh, Ian, where can everybody find you? And find me on social. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Bla the b black lung? I was like, the, don't the cough, don't cough. <laughs> what is it, COVID? You can find me on social media at Ian X Carlos. And if you want to find my podcast at Zachary co host sometimes, SlayerFest98, we're at SlayerFestX98. And if you want to find a horror pod ghost that Zachary and I always co host together, it's My Bloody Judy. Exactly. Well, I think that we'll, we'll wrap up here. So long, farewell to you, my friend, until we meet again. Um, thank we're you. recording and tomorrow. <laughs> oh, I'm done. Okay. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching, and we will see you next time. Bye.